Good afternoon. The subject of my talk today is a project that I call Subchains. And Subchains is both a technique to facilitate on chain scaling, as well as a way to improve transaction verification times. I use the word verification rather than the normal word confirmation because I need something slightly different by it. We'll get into later. But first, I wanted to discuss the motivation behind this project. And as many of you know, the motivation is simply that right now, Bitcoin is fairly lousy as a payment. Looking at some key performance statistics, we see that the Bitcoin network processed on average 1.4 transactions per second last year. And on average, users and merchants needed to wait about 10 minutes to receive from initial verification from a miner that their transaction is likely to be included in the permanent blockchain run. If we compare that to the gold standard payments system, Visa, we see that, well, Visa is significantly better. Visa processes much more transactions per second, and with chip and pin technologies, merchants need to only wait about a second to receive verification from Visa. So I think improvements to Bitcoin on these two performance networks would help spur adoption by making Bitcoin more useful as a peer to peer electronic cash. So the idea behind subchains is illustrated in this animated diagram. And <coughs> You can't really see the colors when these are supposed to be purple disks, and that's great. So the purple disks represent the blockchain. We see new blocks being appended. Uh, in reality, that happens every 10 minutes, so this is obviously sped up. But these smaller disks are weak blocks. And now we see that the strong blocks are being built layer by layer by these weak blocks. Subchains permit larger blocks, which is more transactions per second, for a given level of warp interest, because only the most recently added transactions in that last little gray circle need to be propagated the moment the block is propagated. And subchains achieve, uh, achieve faster transaction verification times because miners find these weak blocks more frequently. And once a transaction is included in the weak block, because subchains are append only, it is very likely that they'll be included strong block. Lastly, subchains benefit miners because they can more easily build bigger blocks, thereby collecting more fee So I said that subchains are built using weak blocks. So what exactly is a weak block? Well, it's basically a normal block with enough PAL, enough proof of work to be hard to find, but not quite enough proof of work to become a valid strong block. And this is a diagram that explains that in more detail. So when a miner is trying to find a block, what he does is he takes the hash of the previous block, he takes the Merkle root of the transactions in his block candidate, and then he tries a whole bunch of NOX values until he finds some sequence that when hashed all together result in a number that when expressed in binary it begins with a large string of leading zeros. To get a strong block, you need lots and lots of zeros, to get a weak block, we still need lots, but not quite as much. So let's get into subchain mechanics in more detail. So we're going to work through this diagram. Here we have a strong block, and here we have a potential block candidate being a mining block. So this uh, legend over here describes this in more detail. The gray squares are represent the transactions. The darker purple square represents the coin based transaction, and the lighter three purple squares are the block head. So at this time, there's going to be a whole bunch of miners, they're all working on the different versions of the next block candidate. Uh, so the gray squares are going to be unique across the network. <coughs> but eventually, someone is going to find a nonce value that satisfies that difficulty target. And probably it'll satisfy the weak target before it satisfies the strong target. So let's imagine. This miner finds a weak block. So what he does is he broadcasts it to the network. The network realizes that that's a valid weak block. And what miner Bob over there does is he says, okay, well now I'm going to take all of his transactions, I'm going to layer them here, and I'm going to start mining a new block on top of that. So I, he can put in some new transactions, but he can point his subchain to this 
so that you can do all those transactions for free without having any more things. So let me just make this clear. So this layer will be consistent across the network, whereas this layer will still be unique to the given miner. Again, another miner will probably find a solution to the, to the weak log. He broadcasts his weak log, sending a reference to, to this on the subchain, and the process begins again. So now, these two layers are calling across the network, whereas all the miners are working on their unique top, top layer. Eventually, someone finds a nonce that satisfies a strong target. He broadcasts that block the same way he does broadcast the weak block. He only has to send his top row. Uh, everybody realizes that's a strong block. The subchain closes, and the process begins again. So there are four important properties of subchains. The first we've already discussed, subchains reduce orphan risk to facilitate more on-chain scaling. And subchains uh, provide zero confirmation security or some zero confirmation security and faster transaction verification times. There's also two, two other interesting properties of subchains, but we are going to leave those for a future discussion. If you're interested, there's a paper called subchains.pdf on the Bitcoin Unlimited website that describes those, three pro those two properties in more detail. But for the remainder of this talk, we're just going to look more carefully into these first two properties. So reduced orphan risk. So this is a technical group, so I think everybody already knows what I mean by orphan risk. But uh, just, to, just, just uh, to make sure, a block is orphan when two miners find competing solutions for the next block. At a given block height, there could only be one block. So if two miners mine finds this block, mine finds this block, only one of them can win. Miners want to avoid this possibility because one of those blocks is going to be orphaned, and the miner will lose the 12.5 victims that he would have otherwise caught. So the probability that these orphan race events depends on how quickly news of solved blocks takes to spread across the net. The probability of orphaning works out very close to tau over big T, where tau is the network-wide propagation time on average, and big T is the 600-second block time for Bitcoin. So if the propagation time of blocks is averaging about six seconds, well, six divided by 600 seconds is about a 1% orphaning rate. If the propagation time were 12 seconds, we'd have about a 2% orphaning rate. And that's not just some guess, you can actually derive that from studying the Poisson results if you're on a math geek like me, but I won't say anything more about that. Uh, so subchains reduce the block's propagation time because only the most recently added transactions need to be propagated, thereby reducing the probability of orphaning. Only that top row needs to be propagated. So to see this visually, uh, I'm plotting the block size on the horizontal axis from 0 to 35 megabytes. I'm plotting the percent orphan races on the vertical axes. And the first one we'll look at is using standard block propagation via Bitcoin for what the orphan races would give versus block size. So if small blocks maybe will have a 1% orphaning rate, but as blocks become 2, 3, 4 megabytes, the orphaning probability increases 3, 4, 5%. If we imagine subchains with two weak blocks per strong block, well then only half the information needs to be sent to the blocks. So that cuts the slope of the line in half, and we get a curve like this. If we imagine four or eight weak blocks per strong block, it cuts the slope more and more because now the less information has to be propagated to the block blocks. Eventually, we hit what I call the latency limit, and you, right now, given the current network conditions, that's probably around 64 week blocks per strong block. So I think maybe we can achieve a 9 second week block time at the moment before you basically get decoherence and the network can't come to consensus fast. Okay, so that was property number one. So now moving on to property number two zero contribution security. And in order to analyze this, we need to have a model to do the model render. So my model is to assume the majority of the miners are honest. And what I mean by honest is that they will follow the protocol obediently. We also assume that a small fraction, X, of the miners are unscrupulous. What I mean by unscrupulous 
is that they will deviate from the protocol to facilitate double spending tax if they can earn extra profit by doing so. So double spending today, uh, we can analyze under this framework. So if we imagine an honest miner here, he's working on this block cabinet. If, let's say, some scammer walks into a, a coffee store, he may have paid for his latte with this transaction. So he takes his latte, he now walks down the street, and he broadcasts this double spin transaction, and he offers a bit more fee to try to bribe the miners to replace this one with this one, so he ends up with this coffee for free. Well, an honest miner says, no, that's against the protocol. An unscrupulous miner says, well, yeah, I can replace the green one with the red one, and it doesn't cost me anything. I might earn a bit more transaction fees, so yeah, I'll do it. So the transaction is replaced, and the bribe is accepted. The cost of this attack is negligible right now in Bitcoin. And the attack succeeds with probability x, where x is the percentage of unscrupulous miners. So how does subchains add a cost to double spending zero population transactions? Well now, when the miner, uh, sorry, when the scammer submits his bribe transaction, there's an order to the layers in this block. So these came after these transactions. So the, the unscrupulous miners can't simply swap the transactions like they did before, because that would break the subject. Instead, what they have to do is they have to build a new attack weak block referencing an earlier point in the subchain, or just a, a new block that doesn't reference anything. So they don't benefit from the fact that all these transactions have been pre-propagated. Like if they build on top of the subchain, they can claim all the fees in here for zero working risks. If they broadcast this block, they're going to have to absorb all the orphaning risks for that much larger block. So there's some cost. And as you might be able to imagine, that cost increases the deeper into the subject the transaction becomes buried. So to entice the unscrupulous miner, the attacker must offer a bribe approximately equal to the total fees stuck in the transaction to be double spent. So to summarize, that double spending with subchains, the probability of success for the scammer to succeed is equal to the fraction of unscrupulous miners, so that's the same as zero confirmation today. But now the cost of the attack, instead of being zero, is now roughly equal to the fees in the subchain about the transaction to be double spent with that. Side. So lastly, <coughs> nested subchains. So so far we've considered we have these this blockchain, we have this subchain inside of it. But we have to pick how many weak blocks per strong block. Maybe we initially pick 10 weak blocks per strong block. And then we find out that network interconnectivity improves, so we can actually do 100 weak blocks per strong block. Uh, per strong block. We don't have to change the first layer. We can actually add subchains within the weak blocks, and then sub-subchains within those. And you end up with this nanobot-like pattern where you have Little blocks, little blocks inside of bigger blocks. <coughs> All this uh, confirmation happening at different levels of, uh, of quality. And I think in the future, because we're only limited by the speed of light crossing the globe, and I believe that one second weak block verification times will be possible, thereby reaching these. That's it. Thank you. Um, in the case where you have to decide how many small block, weak blocks per strong block, yeah. how does, and say you nested it several times, how would the network determine um, what level this, this weak, uh, sub block, or weak block, or weak weak block is at? Well, that would be part of the protocol. So, you know, we might say, get, get some miners on board, and we're like, let's just try it, and let's have 10 weak blocks per strong block. So everybody agrees that that's the rule. So now the weak target is going to be one tenth the difficulty of the strong target. Then in the future, we can add a layer of nesting at maybe four times. So, so yeah, it's hard to Yes, Chris? Uh, the question and the quick clarification. When you, talk, when you say 10 weak blocks for strong block, that's probabilistic. It could end up being 3 or 15. Yes, yes, that's right. That's a great point. And I meant to say that. Uh, 
Yeah, so this is showing idealized substance. So I, I, I have to say that. So this would be an idealized subchains with a four weak block or strong block target. In reality, it's not going to look like that. Sometimes there'll be two weak blocks per strong block, sometimes only six weak blocks per strong block. But the target is one quarter, the, the true difficulty target, then on average you'll have four. But yeah, it just, it's hard to get a picture that shows that. Can I ask the, do you mind touching it? Um, okay. Um, the, I have a, a perhaps wrong view that if the relay speed was much faster for other reasons, X then or various other technologies, to some extent that weakens the value proposition of using subchains, right? Because yeah. the orbiting risk is less. But what I can't wrap my head around then is that that cost of the double spending it had, um, should it then, you said it was the, with subchains, the cost is now equal to or some function of the fees accumulated in the subchains, right? But, I feel like somehow that should also be tied to then the like the, this relay speed technology. It, it, it totally is, and so I'm assuming that miners fill the block with transactions if the marginal fee for that transaction is equal to the marginal orbit. Uh, so so that's where it comes come, 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 comes in. So when we move forward and everyone's using X to the blocks probably much faster, that would naturally drop the equilibrium fee level. So 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 yeah, you have less fee protection then. That, that allows us to scale. Yeah. It's just as. Do you anticipate that uh, each miner would be producing their own subchain, or would they all try to produce the same set of subchains? Oh, I think they. I mean, I'm imagining that they all they're all producing the same subchain because that's why they only have to keep track of one subchain. So the protocol will be designed such that you can only reference the global subchain. So the. Uh, the, the speed at which you can produce subchains will, will be limited to the network uh, propagation speed. So what you're basically what you're basically saying is that ten minutes is an excessive time, and we can effectively reduce it. That's the only way they're all they all end up agreeing on the same subchain. Yes, 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 definitely. So I think Satoshi was very conservative when he came up with ten minutes. But now, you know, according to my calculations, which are based on some experiments that Andrew Stone ran and some experiments done by uh, the Cornell team, I think we can probably come to convergence at around around nine seconds or ten seconds. But the nice thing about doing with subchains is if we do have some network disruption that throws it off, all you do is screw up the subchain, we'll still have to come to convergence on the strong block. So I prefer this method over just decreasing the global block time. And I wanted to just touch on one thing Chris said is uh, such things still work in cooperation with technology like Exit because although Exit you can send less information the moment the block is solved, you can also send less information the moment the weak block is solved too. So they, they work together quite harmoniously. Uh, I think one more about Is the propagation of the final strong block done at the speed of the last increment of the weak block? Exactly, yeah. Cool. So that's all you got to send. All you got to do is send the, the most recent layer of transactions and a pointer to where on the subchain you're referencing the rest of your transactions from. Yes. And when they're when they're searching for the hash on the subchain piece, are they doing the same calculation they're doing for the full block? Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's the exact same calculation. So there's no extra work that they have to do. They just have to start transmitting the small blocks immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, could you maybe state again or go into further detail why you think this is better than just having quicker blocks? Um, well, I think, firstly, the battle we're going through trying to increase the block size limit is crazy. And I think trying to go through an even crazier battle trying to reduce the interblock time to one bit would be almost impossible. Um, so there's that. And the other reason is because I think this gets a lot of the benefits of going to a faster interblock time without some of the risk. Because if we did, let's say we change the block limit or the, the block target time to 10 seconds tomorrow, probably it'll be going to work. We're going to have obviously your orphan rate's going to go way up. But maybe there's some network disturbance in the future. There's much more chance of having non convergence of the blockchain at that smaller time interval. Where with this technique, all you do is risk non convergence of the subchain, and the 
blocks will still converge properly. So have we seen those kind of downsides with currencies like Dogecoin or Litecoin? Uh, yeah. I, I think the, the theory of the play target for 12 seconds and that seems to average 15. It can't really be the 12. That seems to be the number. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's another good point that kind of matches this. The fastest networks are around 12 seconds or so. And I, I don't know, like, if you look at dog coins, working rate, it's, I think it's 10 or 11% compared to Bitcoin, which is only 2%, and that's due to the faster it can work. Whereas the subchain tech, they won't, they won't actually lose working rates. Hmm. So you get the faster times without the org. You get the faster times without the org rates, but the security is not as strong, right? You, you basically get secured by the fees, or from the fees, right? instead of secured by the block reward as well. So, so that's the cost. Yes. Do folders need, need to implement this even? Like, couldn't just the miners be transmitting these small bits to each other privately? Yeah, they, they could do that. But I think there's a benefit for the nodes, or at least the nodes serving like uh, SPV plants, because now you can imagine a future where you actually have fractional confirmations on your, on your pin. So I, I, I purchase a coffee, and then the merchant can say, okay, I got like 0.01 subchain confirmations. You know, that's not perfect, but it's better than. You, you know at least that a miner is working on that, and if you have found the magic cards, that would already be included. So I think it, it gives confidence to merchants and users. You also know that miner can change, like go with the position of the first pin. This basically would take higher off-end risk to do so, right? So that's already not going to happen. So this is a very high value transaction. Okay. Cool.